All right, I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is, it's 10 a.m. This is the September regular monthly meeting of the Comanche Business Committee. Secretary Treasurer, Mr. Tipikani, would you do a roll call, please? Forrest Kotanipa, Here. Chairman. Diane Doyabai-Sovo, Vice Chair. Here. Robert Tipikani, Secretary Treasurer, here. Hazel Tasaqua, Committee Woman, number one. Here. Ross Carrara, Committee here. Woman, number two. Here. Ellis Kasnavoy, Committee Woman, number three. Here. Jordan Fox, Committeeman number four. Here. All present. All right. Our uh, first order of business is our invocation. Mr. Narcomi, Nansitai. Let me say some sutai, let me do it to us. Let me eat guy. A kitsitana and nummy, let me eat guy. Sakutana eat the hot dubbing hood to it, offer. Sakutana eat the ha honey hood to it, offer. Sakutana ha yerk with a toy, offer. A kitsitana sa dubbity, he na honey hood to it, offer. Sa make of honey cutter, but I go. Thank you for, for using our Comanche language. I appreciate that. You know, it's beautiful to hear. We got some language related matters on the agenda. So just wanted to thank you for the time and effort you put into learning that. Uh, we have uh, an agenda here that we created over the last month. There was a couple last minute things that came up. Um, so. They're not on the agenda, so I'm raising them in case anyone on the CBC wants to make a motion to amend our agenda before we set it. I so move. All right. And the two things that came up uh, were to add the special meeting minutes to, it says the second bullet point after the invocation right now says July and August meeting minutes. So we need to add the special meeting minutes. And then there was a, um, 638 contract from prevention and recovery so those are the two things and i would recommend adding that with the other 638 contracts so in between resolutions 121 and 122 is that uh your motion still stand vice chairwoman yes okay motion to amend the agenda by uh the vice chair any is there a second 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 by committee woman number one tashikwa any discussion all right, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Abstention, motion passes. So that's the new agenda. Is there a motion to approve that new agenda as amended? I make the motion. Motion by Secretary Treasurer Tipikani. Second. Second by Committeeman number two, Carrara. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Abstentions, motion passes. All right, so the very first thing on our agenda is an award for Lacey Pueblo. Can we get the mic to whomever is going to explain and present this award? This is an exciting achievement, as I understand it. Our fellow officers, line up. I'm going to have our post commander, Jim Reese, uh, explain a little bit about what this award is. What the award is. Thank you. Sorry about that. We're all a little afraid of the mics. So this started back in March of 22. Officer Pueblo, with assistance of several other officers, rescued a man that had crashed in the Medicine Creek. So we wrote the award up with the help of Chief NATO and input by Officer Lacey Pueblo. Dave Finch was our wordsmith. We sent it up as our representative for our post for Officer of the Year. She won our district, then she moved on to department. She, we were able to present her with the department award last year at our convention. And this past year, she went up for national level award, and she came in a runner up for the national award but she did win Central Region Award for Officer of the Year. 
So we have a little plaque for horse, it's Central, Central Region Law Enforcement Officer of the Year. We're gonna fix this, but Officer Lacey Pueblo, outstanding selfless service over and above normal duties through community service and professional achievement, thereby exemplifying the meaning of the phrase, America's finest. You reflect great credit upon yourself, the Comanche Nation Police Department, presented by the American Legion, and this was presented at the 2024 Department Convention of Oklahoma, and is signed by our National Security Chairman and our National Commander. So the other officers, Lacey want to be in the face of the department. We know everyone helped, but you get the recognition for your Comanche Nation Police Department. So thank you very much. Officer, would you introduce your other officers for us as well? Yes, uh, of course, this is Chief John Derndcake. This is uh, uh, Sergeant Childers and Deputy Chief Wilson Ware. Yeah. Deputy Chief, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. We hope you'll accept this from us. Thank you, thank you thank so you much. Thank you for what you guys do and appreciate you us having us here to present. I might add that the, she, her name in the Midwest region went, she went up against five, seven other states in our Midwest region. Indiana, Missouri, Michigan, Kansas, North and South Dakota, and Nebraska. And she won over all those states in the American Legion out of their post, which were a medium-sized post, and they're much larger than our post. So may the good Lord bless you in what you do always, all of your supporting Nottingham and your fellow officers. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, the committee, I thank you very much for letting us honor our nomina. Thank you very much. Uh, Officer Puebla, did you want to say anything? Uh, uh, first off, I just want to say thank you to everyone that came. Uh, clearly, this was a surprise. Um, but if it wasn't for the people in my department, I don't think I'd actually be here continuing. Um, I also want to say thank you to the nation as well for allowing me to be an officer that I am today. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for everything, guys. <laughs> Officer, Officer Powell, before you go anywhere, I did just want to say thank you on behalf of the Comanche Nation. You know, I know how a lot of uh, first responders, police officers, you know, they're, they're, they're humble people. And so I know that you probably just say you were just doing your job, but you really did go above and beyond duty and you really did something you know special for the family and for you know making our police department and our, our nation look really good so i just wanted to say that uh all right our next agenda item is approval of minutes we have a july meeting a July regular meeting, an August regular meeting, and then we have a special meeting in August. Uh, so take a moment if you haven't to read over those minutes and then whoever makes a motion, you can make it one at a time or you can make it all together, however you wanna do it. I make a motion to approve July, August, and the special meeting minutes. All right, there's a motion by committee woman number three, Casnavoy, to approve all three meeting minutes. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Second by committeeman number four, Fox. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Abstentions? Motion passes. Next up on the agenda is my report as the chairman. I went to several meetings and I wrote several letters. 
and uh, this is not in chronological order, but kind of by subject matter, I wrote a letter to the Bureau of Indian Affairs asking for more base funding for our court under our 638 contract. That was followed up by a meeting with uh, several officials from the Bureau of Indian Affairs where they basically said they didn't have any more money um, and nonetheless promised to try to find some money. And so discussions with our court administrator and the VA are going to be continuing. I met with the city of Lawton. A group of us met with the city of Lawton. It wasn't just me, but a group of us, including our natural resources director and our EPA director, met with the city of Lawton regarding the wastewater treatment plant. They were happy to report that they are currently in compliance with their DEQ permits. They are undertaking an upgrade. And so hopefully this will resolve many of the issues regarding East Cache Creek. There is going to be continued challenges because there are other sources of pollution for that creek, such as agriculture, and a prison were two things that were pointed out, but we will continue to closely monitor the E. coli and other pollutants and contaminants in the creek. I also went to a Lawton Chamber of Commerce meeting. It was called the State of the City. They invited me to go there to give an invocation, and so I did. I met with our Congressman, Mr. Tom Cole, once and I met with his staff another time. So between meeting him or his staff, I actually met twice with his office. He was concerned about a few issues in our district, including tribal housing, tribal law enforcement, resources for behavioral health, and then a food distribution supply issue. Um, so I'm happy that he's interested in all those issues. I agree that those are all um, and very important issues for our tribe. So I'm glad that he was willing to meet with me and, and his office, his staff, and to you know, lend his ear and spend quite a bit of time. His staff toured our prevention and recovery residential treatment facility. And they also saw our police station and they met with our chief of police. And then he, he himself went to our Comanche Nation Housing Authority and learned a little bit about what they've been doing. I wrote a letter of intent to participate in an intertribal coalition to manage the Dawson Elk Valley Ranch, which is in New Mexico. This would be, um, again, an intertribal coalition that would be managing this land for conservation purposes. This is a coalition that is um, the TIPO office was taking the lead on um, negotiating and coming together. So that's something you may be hearing about more in the future. I also wrote a letter to the Carlisle Indian School to begin the process of repatriation of remains of one of our tribal members that passed away while they were, while well, she was a student at the school. She was 14 years old. Her name was Frances Bones. On this particular one, I've come to learn that maybe there was some misinformation or, you know, poor communication because I've heard people talking about, you know, there was an infant exhumed at the school and is now buried at Otopobi Cemetery and things like that. And so that's not the case. No one has been exhumed. And it may be the case that no one has ever exhumed if we decide not to go forward with this. This letter was just to start a two year process. So in September 26 is when this tribal member would be exhumed and would be returned. So we have two years of planning. So this is step one. So I invite anyone that wants to participate in the planning for this um, to reach out to me and we can you know, do this together. The Otopobi committee has graciously offered to have her buried there if that's what we collectively as a nation want to do. Um, but again, any comments on alternatives are totally welcome. And I think this is going to be a very significant event once it happens because Frances Bones was the daughter of one of uh, our chiefs, you know, that we had a lot of chiefs of different bands and this particular chief was named Bones, um, but in Comanche, Tsoneep was his name and there's not a Bones family as you all probably appreciate. And so this is someone that I don't want to be lost just to the tide of history. You know, someone that didn't have children and 
went far away was taken you know, forcibly. And we even have a resolution on these boarding schools coming up today. So this is someone that was taken away and passed away, and I don't want her or you know, her family to be just lost to history. So I want to do something um, special when that time does come. But it's, again, it's two years away. So I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves. I also attended a consultation with Fort Sill, uh, and that was mostly regarding their construction plans and any sort of potential archeological or historical site disruptions. And in particular, what they were wanting from us as a nation was to enter into a programmatic agreement regarding construction and archeological and historic sites there. So it's something we will consider and negotiate with them in the future. The had an update on the tax commission. I had wanted to appoint a few more tax commissioners from the public. The CBC decided against that at this time. There's a couple reasons for that. One is that we'd actually need to amend the tax act. There was a resolution two years ago, or three years ago, that said that the commission is limited to the seven CBC members, um, which I'm happy to do, and I think we should do, but I think Leading into that, we need to decide as a CBC what direction this tax commission is going. There is talk of doing this insurance domicile, in which case we want people with insurance expertise. We've been talking the last couple of months about this oil and gas severance taxes, so maybe we want people with oil and gas. I think we need to decide a direction for our tax commission to go and then fill it with people that have those sorts of qualifications. So I plan to revisit that particular issue in December. I hosted a town hall meeting last week to talk about a couple constitutional amendments. I will incorporate the comments received and submit these proposed amendments to the business committee once the issue on whether we will be having secretarial elections to amend our constitution going forward is resolved. So that's an issue that's on our agenda. Once that issue is resolved, in other words, once we have an election to either include or exclude that, then I'll present these other amendments and we'll go forward. I'm happy to continue to hosting town halls on the Constitution. It seems like people are very eager to talk about the Constitution at a broader level. And so, like I said at the town hall, I'm happy to keep on talking about the Constitution. Um, and I think, you know, on the broader level, uh, one issue that I think people are e very eager to talk about is whether we should have branches of government, you know, emulate kind of the federal constitution, which has three branches of government, or whether we should continue to have kind of a council and committee format, unitary form of government. So that will be the subject matter of a future town hall that I will um, schedule maybe next month. The budget and the topic of money is going to come up a lot today in our meeting. Um, part of that is because we have gaming revenues that are slowing down a little bit and management of our casinos is attributing that to competition from the Apache Lone Star Casino. We are going to be about 9% short of the budget that was set by the Tribal Council. And so you might ask yourself, how are we going to make up that shortfall? For the programs and services, we're just going to pull money forward that was not spent in prior years. And there's a resolution that will explain that. On the per capita, basically, we're just going to bite the bullet. Um, and so that means your per capita may be $100 or $200 less. And I think that's a small price to pay because considering the alternative. Because what is the alternative? The alternative is to stretch and just try to make it up. And what is the consequence of stretching is that we can't make the types of improvements that I think our casinos need. So I think our casinos need things like new flooring, they need to enhance their amenities, they need to make the casinos better so that we're not just kind of dwindling every year, but we're improving our casinos, we're expanding our business, and then in the long run, we'll have much higher per capita payments. So that's our plan, and we have a resolution on that as well. As an aside, speaking of the per caps, update your addresses. If you've moved recently, like I have, get your new address to um, enrollment, and you will get your per cap on time, or sign up for a direct deposit, and do that by the end of the month. A couple kind of miscellaneous just announcements. Um, if you want to highlight someone, 
you know someone that did something really good, if you know someone that's had a significant achievement, whether that's sports, education, culture, whatever it is, contact the PIO office. I've heard sometimes that they get complaints, and sometimes I even get complaints, like, oh, you didn't highlight so-and-so, but you highlighted this person. Um, I'm not making decisions, I'm not out there scouring. If, you know, the family usually of the people or the friends are the ones that are bringing them forward and getting PIO to know. So you have to reach out, and I know that can be an awkward thing, and you know, people don't wanna brag, so what you really have to do is if you know someone that did something good, you have to brag for them and make sure that you reach out to PIO because there's a lot of great things that Comanches are doing and not all of them are getting highlighted and that's just because they don't have someone pushing it forward and PIO just can't know about everything nationwide all the time. Um, so please, they, but they, at that same time, they would love, I know, to write an article, do a news story, put something on Facebook, we're looking at doing other things like podcasts. So, you know, I know that the PIO office would love to highlight anyone, anytime for anything significant. They just need to know about it. So bring it forward if you know someone and do their breaking for them. And then let PIO do their breaking for them. My office hours, um, I think it's an awesome thing. I've been enjoying doing it. They haven't been full, so I'm doing it once a week instead of twice a week, just to you know have a couple more hours of the week to do other things. My main plan is to have them on Wednesdays, but this particular month of September, it seems like all my Wednesdays got occupied by meetings. Like I had a consultation with Fort Sill this last Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, I have a KCA meeting, and then the following Wednesday after that, I have a consultation with the Wildlife Refuge, and so I'm gonna have office hours on a couple Mondays, September 16th and September 23rd. So if you wanna come by and meet me in person or on Zoom, if you wanna come by and meet me in person, just come to the office, Zoom, fill out the form, but it'll be Monday the 16th and Monday the 23rd. Last thing I wanna say, so I wanna give a shout out to JD Walkway, who's over here, and his staff with enrollment. Um, when I started, I didn't quite appreciate how important the enrollment department was, but it's, Super important and they're super busy. All, a lot of our federal funding depends on formula that turn on enrollment. And so they have to take the lead on that. I just mentioned the per capita payments. They do a lot with that and you'll see we have so many people that want to get enrolled this month because it's the end of the fiscal year and they want to get their per capita payments. So I know he's just, and his staff have been super duper busy. So I just wanted to give some recognition for that. And then also um, I just wanted to let everyone know that they are, in addition to doing all their day-to-day -day stuff, which is huge, they're digitizing our enrollment records. And that is causing there to basically be a de facto enrollment audit. Because they're not just kind of blindly digitizing things, but when they pull out the files, they're actually going through them and looking at them with a critical eye. And I just mentioned that because I know the issue of an enrollment audit is something that's come up at general counsel over the last few years a couple times. And so I'm just letting people know that it's kind of happening organically through this digitizing process when he gets the files and he's taking a critical eye on them. So thank you for all your hard work. And that's the end of my report and I'll pass it on to the vice chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, myself, I've been working just on a few things. So um, I'm working with, still working with conservation district to finalize things there. Uh, we're reorganizing and looking for some more uh, tribal members to sit on that board with us because we've got to change some officers. Uh, we've been in touch with our state conservation people and they're still on board. Our county people are still on board. We're working together to get our uh, data centralized so that our tribal members to, can come to one place because a lot of our tribal members own numerous tracts of lands in numerous counties. Right now you have to go to each county as a person that's our lease people that lease from us, they have to go to each county. So most of the counties are on board and eager because once we get established for our KCA jurisdiction, then that will allow them to come to one place and the information will work directly from us back to them. Um, also, I'm working with our Native American churches to organize a uh, cultural and language days coming up for tribal members. 
We're working on getting a panel of people together. So if any of the tribal members are interested, please reach out to our secretary, Jennifer or myself, or Mr. Komachi, any of the Native American church, and let them know you're interested because we want to bring that awareness to our, not just our youth, but our um, fellow tribes, people, anyone that's interested. The first one we're putting together will be October 14th at Watchtaker Hall. And also um, in conjunction with that, we've got some other projects and meetings coming up with um, myself and the chairman will travel this next week to Texas on some conservation issues for sacred grounds for Comanche Nation. And uh, we also got some other things in the works for the tribe. And uh, as he said, we're open to suggestions and we're trying our best to do good things for our people. So we thank you, the tribal members, for your patience and working with all of us and assisting with us to do that very thing. Thank you. Thank you. I did have a quick question for you. It, the time of that um, Native American church event on the 14th at Watchetaker, is what time is that going to be at? I think that's from 1 to, it's from the afternoon, 1 o'clock, till about 8 or 9. All right. And I saw the audience had a couple of questions, Mr. Tashikwa. Yes. sites of Texas you will be visiting uh, this week please? Uh, the next well the one the meeting that we have coming up is over by the San Antonio area and it's for one of the stopovers that's a historical stopover that our tribal people used to go to if they were on their way going down to the border for their <coughs> yearly you know to get their herbs and medicines and whatnot there was an area there that they stopped over at and would do their camping and there was spring water there and they have current projects that could possibly mess up that ecosystem and they've asked representatives from our tribe and some of the other conservation people in texas to come and sit in to see if the people that are doing construction can possibly change just a few things that will help save all of that ecosystem that's there that has native medicinal plants the water and the wildlife that's there and if they change just a few things, then they can, you know, preserve that and that will remain because since that's one of the historical sites for the tribe, they've asked us to go down and check on that. And the, the spring itself feeds the San Antonio River. Yes. And so the specific place we'll be visiting is called Brackenridge Park, which is just a park on the banks of the river. Close to downtown. Yep. Mr. Wadua. Madam Vice Chairman, uh, going back to the conservancy for farms or landowners, would you expound upon the benefits? On the what? On the conservancy for landowners. The conservation district? Yeah. Yes, what that will do once we get everything established where you have to go to each county to file in for applying for assistance, whether it's to help clear invasive species like uh, mesquite trees or the thistles and thorns that every, all the farmers are fighting. To clear those on different tracts of land, you have to go to each different county. And it's hard sometimes for our tribal members to get assistance because each county has their own priorities, top priorities, for a lot of the federal funding that comes in for that. So sometimes what is priority for our tribal lands is not necessarily priority for that county. So once this gets established, we set our own standards that go right along with US, USDA, NRCS, all the federal programs that currently assist, but that allows us to do the application process for our tribal members on those various tracts of land, and we set the priority for our tribal members and our lands. And it also, by establishing this conservation district, opens up federal funding that normally goes to the state, it will come directly to our tribe, to this conservation district. So that's why, and it's not just for agriculture, it's under the label of big pasture, it's um, natural resources and conservation district. So it's not just natural resources, it will also involve cultural resources as well. Yes, ma'am. Hold on, can you just hold on one second, sorry. Where did Jerry go? I just want you to have a mic so that people can hear you online.
um, the when you say the removal of the mesquite, um, removal as in mulching, it's something that you know we had brought years ago to the CBC, 2015. We were asking if we could get assistance to maybe purchasing a mulching machine. It was actually um, myself right. and your brother that brought that. So right. is that something that That's that something, would do? Yes. Okay, because that would what, be a profit yes, for the nation as well. Yes, what we want to well. do is not just clear it. But what you're taking off of there, there, we're looking at different programs that come in and utilize what you're clearing off to put a different use on there and put things on there such as the new thing, you know, you hear about biochar, yes. working with that. We have options for people that are kind of sitting on the side waiting on this to get the final okay for everything. Any other questions for the vice chair? All right, thank you for your report. Mm -hmm. Secretary Treasurer. I'd like to say, um, you know, we look at the circumstances financially of the nation, and we're ending the month this September is the end of the fiscal year. So we began a new year with a new budget beginning October 1. But as the chairman said earlier, you know, there may be some circumstances where there may be a shortfall in the gaming commission need or in the, in the entertainment need. And we have the revenues to cover that, given that there's some that's been carried over. The same goes for the nation. The nation appears to be doing well. And if there is that need, I think we have that ability to cover that as well. So in the financial sense, we're very fortunate. And I trust this next fiscal year becomes something that we hope can be better than what we thought and anticipated. We had thought we'd have a great effect by different things, the general chaos, so to speak, of the financial matters of the U.S. government, as well as those things appearing on site like the Apache Casino. And that hasn't really affected us that much. So it's good to see that. And with the pending, you'll hear about these things in time, the pending improvements for casinos, the entertainment area, we hope will really enhance the persons to visit because I think we're going to move on things that will really bring further revenues to the nation. At the same time, I keep encouraging, you know, that we have other revenues and other enterprises and business to do business. So we need that very desperately. And I hope we can undertake that with greater gusto and this next fiscal year. At the moment, the only thing that I attended this this past month in August was Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association meeting. And as they normally have, they have a variety, they have an opening kind of subject. And that was interesting to me because it seemed to be so psychological that I was ready to jump over the roof. But anyway, sometimes those comment, kind of comments and those openings wake us up to think about something other than just the circumstances at hand. It makes us think about what we're doing, where we are, how well we're doing. Are we doing our job? Are we on top of it? So I think that kind of sparks those beginnings to a conference like we had there in, in Oklahoma City. Also, I picked up, you know, things like if you get into the area of improvement of your entertainment, your casinos, and et cetera, that have five-year plans. Build out five-year plans and look ahead to see how you're going to really invest in those things. You can't do it with just a short-term plan. You have to have a long-term plan. And that was really suggested, and I, I really appreciate it because I've always believed in that in my life. And then it's even greater than that because if you can go up to 10 years, you're very smart. It's smart to look ahead because as you have opportunity to do something within, the, within your 10-year plan, you can move on it. But you really have to put yourself together where you put those goals, those objectives down as we move forward. You just can't do it as a happenstance each fiscal year. What we can do, we need to say, this is the fiscal year to do this. This is the fiscal year to do that. And yes. You can move it up if you have additional rep revenues and opportunities. The uh, other things I found out, like I was a little amused about it, but, and they said, you know, no matter what planning you do, 
you have all your master planning, then you have your construction planning, remember this, there's no perfect plan. So they always advise you to have contingency fund. Have monies available beyond what you needed to do that basic job. Have money available. So if something comes up and, that, and they said there's no perfect plan, and don't feel bad about it, that's just life. Things come up. But have that contingency available. So you need to have that fund available. So don't just think that the plan is this, because you can construct it at this dollar, but think of that a little beyond, where you have that additional dollar in your place. There was other things that, um, you know, I, I picked up and I could go on and on, but the other thing that I think was most important to me was cyber security. More and more, you know, things are being tapped and hacked. In fact, I learned the ones presenting that said, it's a business. It's a business now. There are business persons in the world, even in the United States, are hack that are hacking. That's their job. They're finding out different things about us. They like to find the information. They like to, of course, find anything fiscal, anything that has a dollar bill to it. So they encourage us to really be smart about cyber, you know, securities. And I know a, a few years ago I visited with the banks and we all got together and because we have accounts here and there, so they invited me. We sat down at that time on this, this subject. We went through and explained all kinds of things that can be done. And at the end, the one that was really sponsoring it said, I want you to know there's no safe system. So always be on guard, always monitoring that to see that you are on top of your cyber, you know, security, because they can steal real quickly. And we have had that effect at the nation. Someone tapped one of our circumstances. So we have to be very wise, and they said, be on top of that. The other thing I picked up was that there are some casinos, and they're just looking, I think, but they're operating cashless, you know? And we're beginning to hear across the country, United States, you know, this pending digital. It's always news that it's pending, it's pending. I don't know if it is or not. But if you look at it, it's probable. There's a probability that we may go digital. No cash. You know, some places right now across the country won't take your dollar bill. They'll take your card. They'll take something like that, your credit card, your debit card, but they won't take cash. There, some places have gone digital. They want, they want to be everything online, in the record, all digitized. So that's something that I think the federal government's been looking at, and we have to be aware of it. But they, they did mention that some casinos are doing that now. And of course, I asked the question that myself as I listened to that, how does the gamer control himself? You know, you can go into that with a digitized circumstance, Think about money in your bank, and the first thing you probably rolled over the money in the bank. You can put yourself in a hole real quick. You know, today in the United States, the debit of the national budget is phenomenal. It's out of range. I don't know if we'll ever get on top of it in the next decade or so. But the other thing is that credit card debt, the credit card <laughs> debt of Americans is phenomenal. When you see how much the debt is on credit cards in the U.S., that's staggering. So when I thought about that and I thought about digitized gaming, well, you could go in there. You want to be sure that you can handle it. So at that point, boy, you really have to be a master of your accounts and of your monies because you can become so addicted, it's so fun to be that way, that you just go overboard and go in debt. So that, that consciousness came to my mind. But anyway, these were the interesting things I heard. There's talk, you know, about sports betting. People want sports betting. And I don't know how far that's going to go, but there's sports betting. One of the points that I appreciated, too, is that as we get into this world of that location of business in the casinos, 
and that kind of money. It should always be a place of integrity. You want integrity, you want honesty, you want goodness there. So it's, that's something you have to work on very hard. And uh, anyway, another point was, I think we have to be prepped Comanche Nation, and I have to be cautious here because I don't want to open up and scare or open up floors where they cause something to challenge us. But we have to always be conscious of our neighbors, Kansas and New Mexico, Missouri, Arkansas, and especially Texas. Texas is one of the big business states in the United States. It is big business. They support business. And it's a place that we need to be. You know, the chairman mentions they're going to go down and see these sacred sites, or these sites, and I want to say it wasn't just to go down and get medicinal. It was down there because they went down there and stayed there. The Pentateuch, you know, band, roamed that Texas area regularly. That was home to them. And as we know, some of our other bands had different areas as well. And they would occasionally get together. I always smile, you know, we call ourselves Comanche Nation. And I think of my grandparents and they would say, it's, they would call the band. They would call the leader of the band, not the leader of a nation at that point. Each of them had their own band chiefs, leadership. I like that. You know, the, the chairman mentioned that as we look ahead for con constitution matters, I really think it's smart to move, you know, to, the, to that free form, judicial, legislative, and executive. And when you go into that, we can really identify our bands. The legislatures can, legislators can come from that band area. We know where they are, more or less. North of the, of the mountain, north of the Wichita's, that's a different band. That band wandered all over, everywhere, and that's what we call them in, in our way. Then we have the south band of Cash in that area, the Quahada. Well, anyway, we can identify the areas by bands and keep our culture going. So I really hope we do that. And excuse me for making that comment. I just had to add to it. But the thing I was mentioning is we have to be wise about Texas. We need to move to Texas in many ways, just for commercial reasons. You think of gaming? Yes. There's another thing that's on the horizon that I really like, and that, you know, we have Aboriginal territory all the way to southern Colorado, half of New Mexico, Texas, even Mexico. But we have all that territory, Aboriginal. One thing that has happened now with the present circumstances of the administration and the Department of the Interior, you can get land into trust in that Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal area. One tribe has done it. And you know, we need to be moving on that, getting some of those lands into trust. And then it can afford many options and many opportunities. So I just encourage us to think about that. Well, again, that's a, a spin-off of my mind, and I just appreciate the time you give me. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wadua has a question or a comment. Uh, Three comments. One, uh, California ranks number fifth in the United in the world as being a nation with that three trillion output and gross <coughs> national sales. Texas is number eight with 1.5 trillion dollars in the world, and so it behooves us to take a look and to go into Texas for many reasons. Now, number one, did you say the National Indian Gaming Commission says we don't have a five-year plan or ten-year business plan or? No, they're not saying that. They're encouraging us to we have. We don't have one right now? All nations do that. Do we have one? I don't think we do oh fully. We have, I think we can say we have something tentatively. Oh, do we retroactively need to establish something like yes, that? Yes, we do. Uh, and I'd say 10 year. Okay, I forgot what the second question is, but I'll yield back. <laughs> Thank you. Any other? Questions for Mr. Tipikani. All right, Tribal Administrator's Report. Good morning, everybody. So the month of August has been big, pretty busy for us. Um, we started off with the outreaches that we held in August the 3rd. We had one here where we gave away almost 1,000 backpacks and school supplies. On August the 8th, we went to Anadarko and we had an outreach there 
and we distributed approximately 60 backpacks and school supplies on August the 9th. We also went to the Oklahoma City Outreach where we distributed 90 backpacks. Um, and then August the 10th, we also went to Dallas and we had distributed 29 uh, backpacks and school supplies. We had a total of 66 um, attendees, 34 adults and 32 children. We also hired a um, employee for the Dallas outreach area. Um, and we also have had a conversation with the chief executive officer with the native, Texas Native Health, who is also going to allow us to utilize a space there um, for our outreach until they finish up the renovations that they're preparing to have other tribal members, um, not other, tri other tribes, do outreaches um, that can assist their tribal members in the Dallas outreach area. Um, I also have been working on our, with Adam on the cell phone bill, um, trying to figure out where all the cell phones, and I did mention this last month. We had a total of 572 lines, when 572 lines that include cell phones, iPads, hot spots. Uh, with those 572 lines, uh, that was costing us $24,300 a month on our cell phone bills. We have suspended 89 of those lines and we are down to 440, and which has cut us down to $4,000 of that bill. We are still trying to figure out where these hot um, iPads are um, and locating those. So we plan on cutting the bill down a little bit more than that, hopefully. Um, we have also made some moves with some uh, departments. NACPRA is now at the administration build, building. Voc Rehab has moved to the Education Center. I Am Indian is at the Education Center. And Emergency Management has moved to CHR Fire. And Injury Prevention is now in the Compliance Building. The reason for these moves is because I have two uh, departments that are currently in leases that aren't ending till next year and my hopes is to get them into areas where we don't have to be paying uh, rent anymore. We also made access to the doors to the community centers um, to be more accessible by establishing an easier way to open doors for our tribal members or any other tribes, people who want to have um, activities in our uh, community centers without having to utilize law enforcement. So Adam has uh, worked with a vendor to get those accessible by the touch of the phone. We also have, um, have talked about the prices of the community centers that will be going up effective October 1st for uh, the deposits for non-tribal members to 150 and for tribal members to be 100. And the reason for this is because the repairs are costing us nearly $500. Sometimes when there's activities in those community centers, it's a huge repair for us, to, and it costs us, the tribe, $500 to repair those restrooms when something's going on and those, uh, something is broke. It's a cost to us, so the deposit really doesn't cover that cost. So, um, and we also, sorry. I also wanna give you an update on the uh, tribal employees of Comanche members. So with the tribe, we have approximately 385 employees. Of those 385 employees, we have 258 that are Comanche tribal members, which is a total of 67.01% of the 100% of, of 385. Um, we have implemented orientation, and we have involved IT, WIOA, compliance, property and procurement and HR as part of a full day of orientation. So and when, he, when we have the new hires, it's every two weeks they come in and they are in a full day of orientation. Um, I also wanna address the fact that I've been getting several calls regarding the gaming commissioners and the board of director um, for them to be applying for those um, seats. So we do take resumes, it, you don't have to do it the way it was set up, Paycom only allows you to go through them to like put in your application, but you don't necessarily have to. You can bring that resume up here to the HR office and they'll give it to the chairman. So I wanna also say that we've been working on the fair. Uh, the fair board and them have been really busy and they've been having a lot of meetings and now they're weekly. 
So on September 26 at 8 a.m., they will be opening up the North Gate to let tribal members line up for their camping spots. It's a first come first serve and we will not be op doing anything online like they did in the previous years. Um, and I also wanna let you know that we will be honoring uh, three Comanche members Saturday, September the 28th after the grant entry for a career hall of fame inductees. One of them is Eddie Clark, who's o Oklahoma Hall of Fame for jazz. Lanny Asa Permi, Oklahoma Military Hall of Fame, and Dr. Cornell Peewee Wardy, Oklahoma Educators Hall of Fame. That is it for my report. Thank you. Tribal Attorney. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well today. Um, I'll be reading off the cases that the tribe is currently involved in. Uh, along with a brief update and then the cost build in the most recent billings uh, statement sent to the Comanche Nation on uh, August 20th, 2024. So the first case is Cherokee Nation v. Department of the Interior. That case was filed in a federal district court in Washington, D.C. Um, in August of 2020. In that case, uh, some Eastern tribes have sued the Comanche Nation uh, excuse me, uh, the, the chairman of the Comanche Nation, um, some other uh, uh, elected officials of other tribes, um, as well as the governor of Oklahoma in their official capacities. That case has uh, kind of been put on hold because there is a dispute over who can represent the governor of Oklahoma. So the Oklahoma Supreme Court is uh, uh, hearing uh, an appeal uh, or oral arguments um, between the Oklahoma Attorney General and uh, the Governor of Oklahoma's attorneys on who can actually represent the governor. Um, the, fill, the, B, the, the fees billed for that were uh, $4,456. The next case is Comanche Nation v. Department of Interior. This is a case where the Comanche Nation has essentially sued um, the federal government and uh, the Fort Sill Apache tribe to enjoin uh, gaming on a trust allotment. Um, there's really not been much of an update over the past few years. There's a uh, motion to dismiss filed by the federal government uh, against the Comanche Nation. Um, but as I said, that motion has just kind of been on hold in, in federal court. That, by the way, that case was filed in the Western District of Oklahoma. Um, and the, our, our most recent statement showed zero dollars billed for that case. The next case is Odapobi Herbert v. Sovo. Um, in that case, former judge uh, Odapobi Herbert sued um, the CBC for uh, essentially wrongful termination. Um, she sued for a million dollars for tortious interference with a business relationship. She is seeking $197,000 for breach of contract, sued for a million dollars for defamation, and then a million dollars for mental distress, humiliation, and embarrassment. Um, Multiple, most of those claims uh, were dismissed by the district court. However, um, the uh, uh, breach of contract claim still remains, and um, that case is currently sitting in the Comanche Nation Appellate Court. The last, uh, the last statement that we billed to the Comanche Nation showed zero dollars billed for that case. The next case is Cass and Void v. Comanche Business Committee. Um, this was a case where uh, Ms. Alice Castanvoid uh, sued, alleging that uh, her suspension was unconstitutional. Um, that was in November of 2023. It is currently in the appellate court, and uh, there's been no action on that case um, since December. And so uh, the fees bill for that month were also $0. The next case is uh, Dr. Cornell P.B. Wardy v. Walkway. Um, this is a case where Dr. Cornell P.B. Wardy um, sued Mr. Walkway in his official capacity to enjoin the recall uh, against him. That was filed in the Comanche Nation Appellate Court in early 2024, and uh, the court has not ruled on the constitutional issues, and there are also some ancillary issues over um, some uh, confidential and privileged documents that have also not been ruled on. The most recent uh, bill to the Comanche Nation, it was $81.75. The final case is uh, Tadanapa v. Comanche Nation. 
Uh, this is where a uh, former CEO of Comanche Nation Entertainment, Ms. Mia Tadanapa, uh, sued, the C uh, sued the Comanche Nation, the CBC in their official capacities, and the CBC in their personal capacities for breach of contract, due process violation, breach of property interests, and fraudulent inducement of contract. In total, she's seeking about $1.6 million in damages. Um, the latest update for that, uh, the uh, district court dismissed all of her claims except for her breach of contract claim against the CBC and their official capacities. She has since filed a motion to reconsider, uh, and then the nation and the officials have filed counterclaims against her for breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty, and unjust enrichment. Uh, most of the updates that I just discussed happened in August and are not reflected on the, mo on the most recent billing statement. Um, so the, uh, the fees for all that will be reported on for the next meeting. Uh, so for now, what was on the most recent billing statement was zero dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, up next is travel reports. Um, I think the Secretary Treasurer just included his in his, his um, monthly report. Any other travel reports? I went to OIG. Okay, go ahead. Um, there are over 3,000 attendees at the conference. There are several classes. I attended uh, topics covering future projects, planning, financing those planning, those projects, um, cybersecurity, regulation, workforce development. Um, one of the key takeaways is the importance of. Okay. Um, one of the key takeaways um, was the importance of protecting every aspect of our tribal imprint through technology and with the cyber, you know, attacks. Um, even through our gaming operations, we need to manage how we incorporate and how we use to our advantage in businesses, government, and tribal gaming. Um, and I also attended the trade show through the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tashikwa? Yes. Um, I attended the um, Shoshone reunion in Idaho, and all I can say is that it was a great experience, um, but, um, and I encourage our tribal members who, to start participating. It's very interesting. You will learn a lot. And um, one of, I attended an executive um, committee meeting and uh, one of the things that there everyone is experiencing is that it's getting so large that the facilities they're having a hard time you know um, facilitating you know each event and I know that w this year this coming year we're going to be holding the reunion next year I believe it's next year and so we are going to be dealing with that issue as well so but again, I encourage everyone to try to participate and, and attend one of these Shoshone reunions. It's very interesting. So we are the host next year, and it's going to be the three days before Comanche Fair. So you got a little over one year to figure out how to be in attendance. If you got to get, take leave or get comp time or whatever, you got a full year. So think about it. Any more travel reports? I don't think so, but just to double check. Okay. So um, up next is our new business and all of our resolutions. Our first resolution is from uh, the Enrollment Department, resolution number 115-2024. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for that wonderful sentiment you gave to our Enrollment Department. We appreciate it. We also love helping our Comanche people. So again, if you have any questions over anything with enrollment, uh, feel free to call. Uh, this is for... September, I'll start from the second, whereas this list includes the names of applicants who have been verified as eligible pursuant to Article 3, Section 1C, membership of the Constitution of the Comanche Nation, which states all descendants of allottees eligible for membership under the provision of Section 1A of the article having one-eighth or more degree of Indian, Comanche Indian blood. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Comanche Business Committee accept the verification of eligibility for the applicants as shown on list number 1338 by the Comanche Nation Enrollment Office. 
and be it further resolved that the Comanche Nation Enrollment Office notify the eligible applicant by letter of their approved membership and further that the enrolled member be provided information concerning their enrollment, including name, date of birth, roll number, social security number, and degree of Comanche blood. So again, I'll forgive me if I pronounce some of these wrong. We had quite a few this month. And again, uh, congratulations to these applicants. First one is Christopher Tanilu Asam, Jonathan Mikhail Asam, Savannah Grace Asam, Everly, Everly Jamay Autone, Brock Dean Baker, Kimberlyn Ray Baker, Cody Cray Ballard, Kimber Jean Ballard, Hope Ann Blair, Terry Alice Blair, Sonny James Blanford, Adelaide Nicole Bryant, Harley Ray Bryant, Jace Austin Leroy Bryant, Chanel Malaysia Bullock, Tosia Jolina Noel Burgess, Leonie Latrice Sandra Caldwell, Alice Bell Chibiti, August Ashish Chibiti, Elliot Jennings Kramer, Jackson Ridge Austin Davis, Tushka Noah Flurry, I hope I don't get this one wrong here. Aliyah, Aliyah Monet Foster, Parker J. Grant, Landon Riker Hodge, Christopher James Hutchins Justice, Okama J, I'm sorry, Okama Gage J, Mabel Renee Johnson, Vincent Nakoa, Manoa, Halio Marcelino, Marcelino, Lucas Jacob Martinez, Eden Faith McClung, Harrison Storm McVeigh, Nathan Bell McWilliams, Zendaya Renee Mykobe, Maverick Lane Miller, Michaela Knight Monatachi, Donovan Morgan Morris, Kerrigan Wayne Onko, Luke Andrew Pockeye, Michael Edward Pofabitti, Lilith Dean Joyce Pueblo, Zamira Aramina Ramirez, Eli Lawrence Tuaimpa Rice, Lillian Kai Richmond, Israel Levi Roberson, Violet Rose Rodriguez, Brylene Dannon Scott, Salem K. Marie Scott, Rocker Lee Segura, Jordan Allen Leroy Shelma Dean, Dakota Elaine Simmons, Aries Orion Smith, Tier Tanasi Stanley, Luna Naomi Inzera Starr, Bentley James Stickney, Amelia Harmony Tartsa, Cesara Pretty Flower, Timbo Bryant, Amaya Asher Thode, Emerald K. Walker, Kobe Glenn Youngman. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, hey, is there a motion to approve resolution number 115 2024? I make the motion. Motion by committee woman number three, Casnavoid. Is there a second? Second by committeeman number two, Carrara. All in favor say aye. 
Aye. Opposed say nay. Abstentions? Motion passes. Congratulations to all of our newest <laughs> tribal members. All right, resolution number 116-2024. This is the ineligible list. Okay, I'll start from the second, whereas the documentary evidence on file with the Comanche Nation Enrollment Office and information furnished by each applicant named on list number 1339 does not possess the required one-eighth degree blood, Comanche blood as provided by Article 3, Section 1C of the Comanche Constitution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that e each applicant named on the attached list number, list number 1339, is determined to be ineligible for membership with the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma because they do not meet the provisions of Article 3, Section 3C of the Comanche Nation's Constitution. Be it further resolved that each applicant on list number 1339 be officially notified of their rejection for membership stating the reason for such determination and including the appropriate appeals, pr appeals provision. All right, any questions? Is there a motion to approve resolution number 116-2024? I make the motion. Motion by committee woman number three, Casnavoy. Is there a second? I second. Second by Secretary Treasurer Tipicani. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Abstentions, motion passes. Our next resolution was the most inquired about resolution in my life over the last several weeks. Resolution number 117-2024. I don't have that with me. Am I reading that one? Yeah, I'll read it. Okay. Um, so this is what is called the Gap Elders Resolution, and I'll start at the second whereas. It says, whereas the Comanche Constitution, Article 6, Section 7F, provides that the Comanche Business Committee has the authority to implement, administer, and report on the progress of programs adopted by the Tribal Council, and whereas the Comanche Business Committee deems it necessary to include the elders that are at least 62 years of age by October 1st through December 31st of this year, and whereas the Comanche Business Committee verifies 45 Comanche tribal members that are considered tribal elders through data received from the Comanche Nation Enrollment Program, and now therefore be it resolved, the Comanche Business Committee accepts the verification of eligibility for the 45 tribal mem members considered as elders by October 1st through December 31st of this year to receive their elders distribution payment along with the other elders as described in the revenue allocation plan. And be it further resolved, the Comanche Business Committee will notify City National Bank Lawton, Oklahoma of the decision to distribute the elders payment to verified tribal members. So for those of you that don't know, this is our last meeting before the end of the fiscal year. The fiscal year ends September 30th. The fiscal year, it's obviously kind of like a financial sort of metric and some people, um, most people just operate on a calendar year. And so this resolution is to give people that are elders this calendar year the benefit of the elders payment from this fiscal year. Any questions? Is there a motion to approve resolution number 117-2024? Motion by Vice Chairwoman Doi Bai Sovo. Second, I think whoever was over here was that Mr. Carrara. Second by Committeeman number two Carrara. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Abstentions? Motion passes. We have our next resolution from the WIOA program. Resolution number 118-2024. <clears throat> This resolution is to approve the amendments to the workforce WIOA guidelines for the work experience. Whereas the Comanche Nation is a federally recognized tribe with the constitution approved by the Secretary of Interior on July 9th, 1967. No safeguard tribal rights, powers, or privileges to improve the economic, moral, and education and health status of its members and whereas 
The Comanche Constitution, Article 6, Section 7F, provides the Comanche Business Committee has the authority to implement, administer, and report on the progress of programs adopted by the Tribal Council. And whereas the Comanche Nation establishes the Business Committee as its duly elected official body designated to conduct business on behalf of the Comanche Nation and shall review and establish priorities and prepare amendments and prior guidelines created and whereas the Workforce Department has updated and will amend written program eligibility guidelines for CNG funding services and whereas the Workforce Department makes the following amendments to the current eligibility guidelines for the CNG funded service. Number one, work experience, WE program. At any work sites, depending on the job duties and plus any credential attainments, clients pay rate will start at $15 an hour and will not go over 20 per hour. A matrix will be developed based on the educational attainment, training, com completion, past work history, and time been out of the workforce will be considered when scoring the client for an hourly rate recommendation. Participants, participating clients will be required to attend one career development class hosted by the workforce staff and local workforce partners prior to the starting of the work site. Topics will cover resume building, learning how to budget, dress for success, interview skills, soft skills, hard skills, focus group discussions, career assessment, and time management. These services can now be provided once a year for a six month waiting period if the program is unsuccessfully completed and no employment could be obtained during the six month waiting period. A new worksite placement will vary to allow additional eligibility training or to enhance current skills and learn new skill sets. Number two, client will not have the option to return to the same worksite as before unless the worksite is going to train them for a different position within the department to advance the skill learned in the prior placement. The work sites will increase its time frame from eight weeks without extension to 240 hours or 12 weeks, whichever comes first. Emergency extensions will be granted if the employer needs time to hire the tribal client. The request for extension must be submitted in writing prior to the end date for consideration and approval by the director. Funding must be available for the extension to be considered for approval. Client negligence of completing this service due to dropping or being terminated prior to the completion will have a two-year waiting period, and that is going to change in this resolution to a one-year waiting period, and a favorable recommendation must be submitted by the workforce job developer or other partner or past employer before being eligible to reapply for services. The services provided to the clients who are unemployed, part-time, or full-time permanent employees will not qualify. Therefore, it be resolved, the Comanche Business Committee hereby approves the updated and amended Workforce Department guidelines effective September 7, 2024. All right, thank you. And as I understand it, as you pointed out, one of the main changes this will have to our workforce guidelines is to reduce the waiting period from two years to one year for those that drop out or are terminated if they have a favorable recommendation. Uh, as I understand it, the other significant change to the guidelines is to increase the pay rate from $10 an hour to 15 an hour. Is there any other thing that you want to explain just in kind of layman's terms? Another important thing is that the time frame of the training is going to go from eight weeks to 12 weeks, giving them more time to be in that, in that workplace. And then another significant change is they weren't able to be placed at the same work site. So 
now they can go back to the work site as long as the work site gives them another training skill set that they're going to acquire if they're if they're replaced there so if they get a placement at one work site two times then that's going to give them significant work history to be able to apply and get on permanently within the nation so i think those big changes are going to enhance the participation of the clients on the work experience and just help them to build upon um, their skill sets. All right, any questions from the CBC? Okay, any questions from the audience, Mr. Toshikwa? And just let Jerry get you that mic so we can all hear you. Yes, uh, can you tell uh, uh, what the average uh, persons that are in it each month is there average or how many we have like do you have employed right now or in training how many clients do you have in an average a month um on the work experience activity it can range from five to ten a month and on classroom training it's probably triple that probably 20 20 to 30 a month I believe, I think when we talked about this, you said that your goal is to have 70 clients for the work experience program annually? Yeah, 70 to 75. And then on our youth program, there's over 100 that are served. Any other questions? All right, is there a motion to approve resolution number 118-2024? I'll make that motion. Motion by committeeman number four, Fox. Is there a second? Second. Second by committee woman number one, Toshikwa. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Abstentions. Motion passes. All right. At this time, it's 11.16 a.m., and I am going to call a five-minute recess for the benefit of those that want to <coughs> use the restroom, but mostly just for the benefit of our stenographer to rest her fingers. So we'll be back in exactly five minutes.
calling it back to order after our um, recess, short recess. It's 11.23 a.m. and we are called back to order. We are on resolution number 119-2024 and this is from our tribal court and our court administrators here. Ms. Mythlow, please proceed. Good morning. Uh, this resolution is to approve the renewal memorandum of understanding for continued legal services between the Comanche Nation and the Great Plains Legal Services, LLC. Whereas the Comanche Nation is a federally recognized Indian tribe with a constitution approved by the Secretary of the Interior of the United States on January 9, 1967 to safeguard tribal rights, powers, and privileges to improve the economic, moral, educational, and health status of its members. And whereas the Comanche Constitution, Article 6, Section 7F, provides that the Comanche Business Committee has the authority to implement, administer, and report on progress of programs adopted by the Tribal Council. And whereas the Comanche Nation desires the renewal of a memorandum of understanding between the Comanche Nation and Great Plains Legal Services, LLC, to provide public defender, garden ad litem, and legal aid clinic services for Comanche Tribal members through the Comanche Nation <coughs> Tribal Court. And whereas the proposed term of the Memorandum of Understanding shall be from October 1, 2024 through September 30th, 2025. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Comanche Business Committee does hereby approve and authorize the resolution between the Comanche Nation and Great Plains Legal Services, LLC. And be it further resolved, the Comanche Business Committee acting for and on behalf of the Comanche Nation does hereby authorize this resolution for such intent. All right, thank you. Uh, and we have the managing partner of Great Plains Legal Services here, Mr. Joshua Farmer. Yes, good morning, thank Mr. Chairman coming. and uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is Josh Farmer. I am the managing partner for Great Plains Legal Services. Um, we have been the, the PD and GL service provider for the last couple of years. Well, since the court stood up, um, I've actually practiced out here before the court stood up when this room was where they did the uh, guardian ad litem or the, the guardianships uh, for the minor children. Um, so this is kind of in a way I started out here and I've grown with the court uh, and we definitely appreciate the opportunity to provide these services to the tribe and to recap that for the last year to date um, we've had uh, 283 members that have come to the clinic um, which averages out to be about 35 a month um, we've had uh, 96 total cases year to date that we've worked on that would be a combination of criminal cases um, which would be both felony and misdemeanors um, and then uh, guardian ad litem. Uh, we also do the juvenile deprived docket, um, which that's come out to uh, roughly uh, about 15 cases a month that we're actively working on. But at the same time, we're managing anywhere from 15 uh, to 20 criminal cases and 20 to 40 uh, GAL cases uh, at any one time during the year. Um, ongoing, uh, we have some new things coming up uh, that are we're going to get in this next year, which is the outreach, uh, outreach program. Um, that I just learned about recently. Um, Mrs. Mithlow has come to me um, to figure out how we can adapt our services. I know there's one in Oklahoma City. There's talk about one in New Mexico. There's one in Texas. Um, so we're going to make our services available remote for that um, via Zoom. Uh, and we'll start with that and then uh, see how that works. And if we need to expand on that, we can. Um, with that, I'll open it up to any questions you guys might have. All right. Um the just just so everyone knows the services that are covered under this mou are public defender which i think everyone understands what that is guardian ad litem and for those of you that don't know what a guardian ad litem does a guardian ad litem is an advocate for children in child protection matters so in a child protection matter you have someone that's advocating for the tribe or for the county or whoever is saying that the child needs protection i guess in this case it would be the tribe and then you have an attorney for the parents of the tri of the children, and then you need to have someone to represent for the children themselves. And so that's the guardian ad litem. And then there's this legal aid clinic where tribal members can come in and just seek kind of short, free legal advice. And one of the things that I am always trying to do is let people know if they don't live here, what services they can access. And so can you tell us, can people remote into the legal aid clinic? Is the legal aid clinic available to people that don't happen to live within the boundaries of the KCA reservation? Yes, for sure. Um, so there's not an ability per se to remote in because it's not a, um, an online uh, forum. 
However, um, what we have right now, um, often we have uh, call-ins. to the, They call the court clerk during clinic hours. They transfer it to us. Um, or if we're with someone, we'll call them back. Um, for the, as I was saying earlier, for the remote services of the um, outreach centers, we're going to set up a Zoom system for that, um, which we could also implement at the uh, weekly clinics if it became something that was on demand. If, it, if there were enough demand for it, we could definitely um, implement that. Of course, they just have to be in line with everybody else that's in line if, they're in, if there's a line in outside. So I don't want to create a, uh, an overwhelming population of people that need help that we can't get to in one day. However, uh, we're definitely open to helping people remotely. All right. So if you need legal advice and you're not from, you don't live around here, you can call in to the weekly clinic and we are going to be doing these clinics, we're going to be taking them on the road with these outreach events and having them at our outreach offices from time to time. And, and the other thing I would say about the clinic, um, one of the most useful things, it was, I think, originally designed to help with people that needed help in tribal court. However, at least half of the, the people that come see us have questions about state court. They got served with some kind of paperwork, whether it be a, a, a family case, a civil case, and really they just need to know what do I need to do with this, where do I need to go. And so that is, that is probably about half of what we do, is help them and push them in the right direction, not only in tribal court, but also in the state courts, to, because they just don't understand what's going on, and they need a, a third party uh, that's neutral to point it out to them and then push them in the right direction. So we get to do that a lot. All right. Anyone from the CBC have any questions? All right, Mr. Wadua. Um, sounds like a nice program. I didn't know we had this connected to us. Is there a bu budgetary obligation on our part? We pay $150,000 for their services, for all three services, Public Defender, Guardian, and Litem, and um, the Legal Aid Clinic. It's it no cost the to the members to go to the Legal Aid Clinic. It's a free clinic, but the tribe... And that comes from the gaming. And it comes from the gaming money from the tribal court's budget, as I understand Second it. Second question. Is that... Just let me just get confirmation. Does the money get paid from the tribal court budget? Yes, or from... Okay. Uh, right now, I've got it coming out of uh, BIA. It comes out of the BIA funds, okay. Uh, you involve wills? Uh, yes, we do a wills clinic every quarter. Um, I think year to date we've uh, either started or completed, a 60, we have 65 attendees um, this quarter's, and um, we've either started or completed uh, all of their wills, so they're in some point. But yes, we do one a quarter. Any other questions from the audience? Mrs. Burgess, and let's get you a mic. Um, in regards to the wills, um, after you help the tribal members, um, where are they filed? Um, I, I don't think they file them anymore. They used to file them in the county clerk, and I heard that they used to file them at the BIA. Um, the problem I know in the county was the only person that could get them out was the person that filed them. So if you passed away and you didn't pull your will out, then you couldn't get it. Uh, so I don't believe they do that anymore. What we do is we provide uh, the original in a sealed envelope, and then we give them however many copies they want. Usually we, we tell them to give copies to those that they uh, want to be their personal representatives so that the important people have a copy and they know where the original is. And of course we tell people put it in a safe, put it in a uh, safety deposit box, somewhere that uh, your relatives can find it. And again, um, you give it to the most important people who are gonna be your personal representatives. So is it possible at some point the CBC can do something about that because what's going to happen is these wills that are being done here and they're not being filed how are they going to stand up when it comes probate time the okay um being filed or not filed doesn't determine the validity of a will um, it's really how it's processed at the beginning so lo so so long as it is witnessed correctly and notarized then it's a self-proving will and you don't have any problems like that uh, it's when it's handwritten um, or those types of wills when you run into problems as far as um, them standing up in court. Um, but if they're, if they're properly um, exercised, if you do and come do one at the clinic, we have uh, two witnesses. We always have a, pair, uh, a notary, uh, so those would definitely stand up. All right, Mr. Siminski. Seven and a half years to find my house deed. That was a racketeering judge. They were signing our names to land documents <coughs> over there at the BIA. You're an attorney. I'm a forensic detective and also a paralegal. I don't like people 
not seeing it on my head and tell me it's raining out there. You know, that's why I, I filed a complaint with the U.S. Attorney. The F, uh, all these people were cutting our throats for land. And that house deed, I was paying the taxes on it and the utilities and couldn't do a damn thing with it. And they found it seven and a half years later in Stillwater. They were trying to steal the house, too. And just for clarity, the, the ones that did that were not great, great Plains Legal Services, so. Yes, that, I, that was right. in the past. Um, other questions, Ms. Ray? Yes, um, I was wondering if there would be, since we are, it would be mostly, I mean, natives doing this, is there any way that that could be tied back to our enrollments to, to store, you know, like or us having our own system? Oh, you mean like filing with the enrollment department? I mean, we could file with our, our own tribal court. It, that would be a possibility. Um, and we can certainly look into that. It seems like it's the responsibility is mostly on the person making the will to make sure it gets out. Is that right? That is correct. The, the, since there is no central repository, um, it is on the, um, the testator, who's the person making the will, um, and to make sure that their relatives know where it is and that it's in a safe, uh, that the original is in a safe location. Because you do need the original um, when it comes time for probate. Mm. Do other places have central repositories that do not require the decedent to be the one that accesses it? I don't know the answer. They, they don't in Oklahoma that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and I, I haven't researched other states, to be honest. I don't know. Okay. Um, sure, Ms. Ray. Yes. Um, as we know, a lot of times we have incidents where people divorce. Think wills get lost. They do. Or they're taken or held. So I think in our best interest for our tribal members if we could try to have a central storing system. I've had it in the um, native world and in, reg in um, other courts. We've always had problems. Okay. Thank you very much for the comments. Uh, Mr. Fox and then Mr. Narcomi. Yes, uh, you said that it would have to be a, the original will. Uh, I know we're moving towards electronic. A lot of people are, the world just as a whole. If we were to take that original and then file it within enrollment as, you know, maybe they can pick three individuals that they would like to disperse that on their uh, enrollment file as well. Would that suffice? That, that's, a, a, that's a complicated copy. question. Um, that would depend on the court to which you're going to yes. present it to. Um, I still think that you would most likely have to be able to pull out the original to present it to the BIA or if it's in state court. The, both of those entities are going to require um, the original that, that you can tell is the original. Um, so I think that uh, getting a central repository is a good idea, but you're going to have to be able to pull out the original. So the originals will have to be kept intact. Uh, and until the legislature in all of those areas changes it to where they'll accept digital copies, we're going to have to be able to pull out the original. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Narcomi. Uh, hello. My name is Mr. Narcomi. Um, so is this um, not just um, legal advice, but legal representation too? Um, in some instances, so the legal clinic is just for legal advice. Uh, now we do do periodic pro bono cases depending on the circumstances. Uh, most recently, um, we did a, a small estate probate. Um, we need to get a vehicle uh, from a, a grandmother's name into a, a granddaughter's name, so we were able to help with that. And um, last year we did a pro bono adoption um, so we do help in the clinic with some pro, bo uh, pro bono, depending on case by case. Um, the legal representation comes from the PD and the GAL, so we do all of the uh, public defender work uh, that's assigned by the court. Um, we do not have, uh, I know in the past other entities had a secondary um, financial requirement. We do not have that. If the, cor if the courts determine them to be indigent, then we take the case, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. Uh, and then we, of course, as the chairman was explaining, we do all the guardian ad litem, and that is our job is to protect the Comanche Nation children. Okay, I got one more question. Sure. Um, do you guys handle um, s traffic tickets and speeding tickets? Uh, within the tribe, you mean? Could we come to you for that sort of thing? Um, right now, that's not something that we've been assigned to, as far as, that would have to be assigned by the court. So okay. under the current contract that we have, the memorandum of understanding, that is not part of it. Okay. Okay, Mr. Wadua. Yeah. Uh, this will be directed to CBC, and I like Mr. Fox's idea of digitizing. I think it'd be better off to keep the original in your house. Is there anything like the uh, 
the housing authority, which tends to lose most documents, you have to start <laughs> over again. I prefer that individuals keep their own wills in their house in a safe place. So. And I, I will say, Mr. Chairman, that if you do lose your will and you, and you did it at the clinic, we have a digital copy of a blank one. So we keep the, once we draft your will, we keep the digital copy that's blank, that's unsigned. So if you need to amend it or if you need to replace it because it got lost or destroyed and you did it with us, it'll be much simpler. You just come back out to the clinic, we can pull it back up and, and reproduce it for you. All right, thank you. Thank you for, you know, going into the legal field to be a legal aid attorney, you know, it can be thankless, but, you know, I commend you for that and encourage everyone. It's not fun to think about death, but it's important to plan, especially, you know, with fractionation of land. So I encourage everyone to come to the clinic and create a will. Any more questions from anyone? All right, is there a motion to approve resolution number 119-2024? I make the motion. Motion by so committee woman number three, Casnavoid, seconded by vice chairwoman Doya by Sovo. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Abstentions? Motion passes. Our next set of items is all about, are all about um, public law 638 contracts. And our first one is from the higher ed department. Okay, thank you. This is a resolution authorizing Comanche Nation to renew public law 93-638 self-determination contracts for higher education, adult education, and job placement and training programs. And I'm gonna skip down to the third whereas. The Comanche Nation Constitution establishes the Comanche Business Committee as the duly elected official body designated to conduct business for and on behalf of the Comanche Nation and shall review, establish priorities, and prepare amendment to the contract prior to the proposed execution date. And whereas the proposed term of the multi-year contract shall be from January 1st, 2025 through December 31st, 2027. And whereas the Comanche Business Committee will renew existing Public Law 93-638 self-determination contracts for higher education, adult education, and job placement and training programs. This resolution authorizes the Comanche Nation Chairman to sign Public Law 93-638 contract renewals and or funding agreements. And now therefore be it resolved that the Comanche Business Committee hereby authorizes the Comanche Nation Chairman to sign and renew Public Law 93-638 self-determination contracts. Thank you, Mr. Bose. Any questions from anyone? All right, is there a motion to approve resolution number 120-2024? I make the motion. Motion by committee woman number three, Casnavoid. Second. Second by committee woman number one, Toshikwa. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Abstentions, motion passes. Our next resolution 121-2024 is uh, the ICW director here yet? Nope, okay, I will read it then. This is a resolution, application to the United States Department of Interior Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA, Public Law 93-638, continued annual funding for ICW renewal of contract. Whereas the Comanche Nation is a federally recognized Indian tribe with a constitution approved by the Secretary of Interior of the United States on January 9th, 1967 to safeguard tribal rights, powers, and privileges to improve the economic, moral, educational, and health status of its members. And whereas the Comanche Constitution, Article 6, Section 7F, provides that the Comanche Business Committee has the authority to implement, administer, and report on progress of programs adopted by the Tribal Council, and whereas the Comanche Business Committee being committed to protect the best interests of Comanche children and to promote the stability and security of Comanche children and families, 
as well as to protect the rights of Indian children and their parents. And whereas the U.S. Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Anadarko agencies continued annual funding for ICW renewal of contract grant has funds available annually for a three-year cycle commencing in January 2025 to December 2027 to accomplish this purpose. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Comanche Business Committee does hereby approve and authorize the submission of a contract grant application to the United States Department of the Interior, DOI, Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA, Anadarko Agency's continued annual funding for ICW renewal of contract grant. And be it further resolved, the Comanche Business Committee acting for and on behalf of the Comanche Nation does hereby authorize this resolution for such intent. Any questions? Mrs. Burgess. I was just going to ask, what's the amount? The amount of the ICW, if you give me a second here, I can try to look it up unless someone can save me. Because the director isn't here, this is going to be the type of thing where I'm going to give you my understanding versus maybe what's 100% factual. So take this with that disclaimer. But with that being said, uh, my understanding is that this, the ICW program receives approximately $280,000 annually in grants. And this is in addition to what we give them from gaming. Is this going to allow, does this grant and or gaming dollars going to allow for the hiring of more staff for this particular department? So to answer those questions one at a time, yes, this is in addition to what's provided by gaming. And the answer to the second question is I don't know, but probably not because this is just continuing the funding that they already have been getting at the same level. As I understand it, there's not going to be any sort of increase in funding. So whatever their staffing model is right now, I would expect it to continue. And I don't know if there's any plans. The tribal minister might be able to answer if there's any plans to hire anyone at ICW right now. Yes, they just hired a um, ICW director. And our plan is to get another individual in there to help them. Any other questions? All right, is there a, a motion to approve resolution number 121-2024? I'll make that motion. All right, motion by committeeman number four, Mr. Fox. Second by committeeman number two, Carrara. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Abstentions? <coughs> motion passes. All right, the next item on our agenda was the result of this amendment, so if you have an agenda and you're following along in the audience, you won't see this. Um, but this is from the Prevention and Recovery Program, and as I understand it, they also have a 638 contract, and just as a matter of explanation, it seems like the BIA self-determination contracts, which we just discussed, are on a calendar year, but this one, it seems like, is on a fiscal year, which is why it was somewhat exigent to get it approved today because um, we need to get this signed before October 1st. And it looks like there are um, some contracts. And again, these are from the IHS. And I'll let the director kind of explain what they are, what they say. They were distributed to the CBC via email. Um, but Mr. Ramos, go ahead. If you see, we can get you a mic. Thank you. From my understanding, this is a the original IHS grant or contract that the tribe, Comanche Nation Substance Abuse had 
that eventually became prevention and recovery. So this is the contract renewal with those funds. I, I think it's, I don't know if it's done yearly or every three years uh, with that. And, uh, just something that was there when I became employed back here at the nation. So uh, I think we went over the scope of work and what that contract entails with our substance abuse program that the tribe has. I think this is the original substance abuse program contract. All right, and so this is for substance abuse treatment and it's $212,480. Is there a motion to approve um, the annual funding agreement between the Secretary of the United States Department of Health and Human Services and the Comanche Nation contract number HHSI 2462025001. Make the motion to approve. Motion by Secretary Treasurer Tipikani. Is there a second? Second, second by Vice Chairwoman Doya Baisovo. Any questions or further discussion? Is this do you have a resolution? I mean, we don't have a resolution. There wasn't one was that was submitted, and so we would prefer a resolution. Um, but I also, personally, I don't want to lose out on two hundred and twelve thousand dollars. So that's why I kind of went to the trouble to give that big long number to try to make our motion as clear as possible. But certainly would in future years encourage mm -hmm. there to be resolutions for these contracts. Any other questions? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Abstentions, motion passes. All right, our next agenda item is from the CBC. This is resolution number 122-2024. It's entitled a resolution adopting strategic direction and priority plan for Comanche Nation Entertainment. Um, and this is something that uh, we all worked on and I want to explain from my perspective why I think it's important. And this kind of goes to what you were saying, Mr. Wadua, you know, we need to have a five-year plan. We don't, as I understand it, have a five-year plan right now. Um, and so maybe this will be a stepping stone towards it. But from my perspective, I think it's important to put down some type of plan in writing. And I think that's important for several reasons. Number one is just accountability. What does this plan say? Did we accomplish the plan? Yes or no? Why or why not? And then I think the other thing that's important is communication. When it's written down, it's in black and white, um, and how things have been happening prior to me becoming the chairman is there's all entity meetings with the CEO, and the all entity meetings have the tax commission, gaming commission, and the CEO of Comanche Nation Entertainment. Uh, and there's issues that are discussed, and there's actions that are taken, and there's follow up on it. And that's all good, but I think that a problem that can arise is number one, sometimes the Comanche people are left out of the loop, and then number two, sometimes I think there can be ambiguities when things are just discussed. And so I'm trying to commit things to black and white paper, and I appreciate the other CBC members going along with me to the extent they approve this right now, but this is just trying again to say, this is what we're gonna do with gaming, this is what we expect in the next year. And there's timelines in here that I'll discuss too. But I'll read the resolution now. Whereas the Comanche Nation is a federally recognized Indian tribe with a constitution approved and ratified by the Secretary of the Interior of the United States on January 9th, 1967, to safeguard tribal rights, powers, and privileges to improve the economic, moral, educational, and health status of its members. And whereas the Comanche Constitution, Article 6, Section 7J, provides that the Comanche Business Committee has the authority to promulgate and enforce ordinances and codes governing law and order to protect the peace, health, safety, and general welfare on land determined to be within Comanche tribal jurisdiction. And whereas the Comanche Business Committee has promulgated a gaming ordinance authorizing the conduct of gaming by the Comanche Nation under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, and whereas, the command, and whereas the gaming ordinance provides that the nation has the sole responsibility for the conduct of gaming authorized by the ordinance, and whereas the gaming ordinance establishes Comanche Nation Entertainment as an unincorporated entity wholly owned by the nation, 
and whereas the gaming ordinance requires the Comanche Nation Entertainment Chief Executive Officer to perform gaming related duties as assigned or delegated by the Comanche Business Committee, and whereas the CBC wishes to assign duties to the Chief Executive Officer in the form of express strategic direction and a priority plan, and whereas implementation of the plan requires coordination with the Natural Resources Director who is under the supervision of the Comanche Business Committee and who is responsible for the nation's real property, and whereas investments and improvements required under the plan may be subject to threat from climate change and require federal grants to address such threats, and now therefore be resolved, the Comanche Business Committee hereby assigns the Comanche Nation Entertainment Chief Executive Officer, the Natural Resources Director, and itself the duty of implementing the following priority plan. And here is the plan. Our priority rank number one, meaning this is the most important to the Comanche Business Committee. Uh, the task is improving the Comanche Nation Casino in Lawton, Oklahoma, including an event center, renovations of existing building, addition of a travel center, a bingo hall, and additional office space. Here are the responsible parties. In other words, this is how, these are the people that are gonna get it done. The Comanche Nation Entertainment CEO is responsible for a site plan and negotiation of financing. CBC is responsible for convening a general council meeting to obtain approval for net financing, and the Natural Resources Director is in charge of climate change mitigation and resilience plan and grants. Just as an aside, not reading from this resolution, but just as explanation, as you can, as I just read, we want to build an event center in Lawton at our casino. We've already been working on the site plan. The secretary treasurer hopefully can vouch for this. We have the CEO here. We're working on it. We have the site located on the south side of the property. I think it's going to be awesome. Really looking forward to it. I think it looks great. We're working with some very capable people. In order to make sure that there's not a flooding issue there, we got to apply for some grants to make sure that we keep the flooding out because that south side of the property sometimes gets some water. So we're trying to anticipate all the issues and deal with them ahead of the time. Back to the resolution, deadlines, preliminary site plan, September 2024. We have that, that's what we've been working on. General council meeting, October 2024, that's next month. Final site plan, December 2024. Climate change mitigation and resilience plan, December 2024. So that is our top priority as an organization. Number two priority, renovate Comanche Red River Casino and Hotel and add additional amenities, including new flooring, pool, family-friendly activities, for example, mini, mini golf. Responsible party, Comanche Nation Entertainment CEO. Deadlines begin immediately, completion dependent on construction schedule. Priority rank number three is explore diversification towards gaming off reservation. For example, state licensed gaming, online gaming, acquisition of other gaming operations. Responsible party, Comanche Nation Entertainment CEO. Deadlines are ongoing. Any questions or comments from the CBC members? Okay, from the audience, we'll go with Ms. Toya Koya first and then Mr. Tashikwa. Uh, uh, this sounds like a great and wonderful plan and, um, and I'm all for it. Uh, however, I have a question. Um, 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 the Many of the, a lot of people that I know are work there at the casino, this casino that brings us so much money. And I was explaining to them uh, about what our um, TA was saying that um, the employees here who made minimum wage of $10 an hour, that she was able to uh, bring them up to $15 an hour. So they're saying, well, what are you talking about? And I said, yes, er, now anyone who works for the, the Comanche tribe makes 50, starts out at $15 an hour. And they said, well, I'm still making 10. I'm still making 12. I'm making 13. What do you mean $15 an hour? So the casino, if, the, if I don't know if you on their board or what, but if you could explain to them that there are many people that are under $15 an hour working at our casino. And I think that's a shame that our tribe re realizes the importance of um, 
the economic impact of that on our employees. So that's a question not just for me. I don't work at the casino, however. But many of the people I know, my grandchildren, are making that salary. So if somebody could just explain that to the Comanche Nation Casino. Yep. Thank and you. Our chief executive officer is sitting right here, so you just explained it directly to him. So he just heard it straight from you, and we'll give him a chance to respond quickly. Uh, we are aware of, of the salary discrepancies among our employees, and we do acknowledge that, and we are working to normalize it, not only for the, you know, the lower paid, uh, but across the board, you know, to make sure it's fair for everybody. But we are looking into that. Okay, hey, Mr. Tashaqua and then Mr. Wadua. Uh, mine's just a, an inquiry. Uh, how much, <clears throat> how much of, uh, of the progress that we'll be doing with the casino here, be involved with, you were talking about flooding. How much will the Corps court, court of Engineer be involved in this project? We'll have to pull permits from them, and so that will be a big part of the project. Um, and we won't really know exactly the extent of the permitting that we'll need until we complete the <coughs> preliminary study in the next couple months. Mr. Wadua. I don't know who could answer this question. In uh, April 20, 20, next year, 2025, what would be the capital expenditure that you propose for on the south part of the parking lot and then down at the Red River? What is the magnitude of the amount? What you would you project? Yeah, I think it'll be in the, the tens of millions. Now, does that uh, going to yeah. offset the yeah. per cap for a short season? I think, and I'll let Steve answer too, but I think my understanding of the way that we're trying to time this is that it won't be felt by the per cap because right now something is dragging on our operations and that's the construction of the cash casino. And so we're spending money to build it and it's not open, we're gonna complete it, I understand, in December and have it open, and then we'll not only eliminate the drag from the construction, but then we'll also have the new revenue coming in from the casino, and so we'll use that surplus with Tribal Council approval to finance these new expenditures. But, and then the second question, and I'll let you talk about the first question too, but then the second question is how's the travel center at exit one doing? To answer your first question, uh, we're trying to take in consideration of, of any plans not to diminish the existing cash flow. We're very aware of the, the per cap and distribution. Um, and we're trying to structure it in a way that will not have any negative effects toward it. The tr uh, truck stop does really well for us. Um, the, the Travel Plaza Casino, those machines, when per unit per day, are they're in line with the Red River property. Um, Thank you. It, just, it doesn't get the volume because of, of where it is and how small it is, but as far as... And let's, uh, we'll, let's take them one at a time, one at a time. And, uh, so, and, and one thing I want to point out about this priority plan is that we our top priority is also putting a similar travel plaza on Gore Avenue next to the Lawton Casino. So, so you know, that's part of the plan, and that will have some machines in there. And again, <coughs> very excited about the plans. But we'll go Mr. Tashaqua and then Mr. Narcomi. Mr. Mr. Tashaqua, what was your question? Mr. Tashaqua, I was really referring to the war pony. Excuse me? I think Mr. Wadu was clarifying when he said the casino next to the truck stop, he wasn't asking about the travel center. He was asking how is the War Pony Casino doing? And Mr. Tashapo, is that your question as well? Yes. I, uh, the War Pony is, is, is making us a small amount of money at break even, but it's just, <laughs> there is it's very little potential in okay. that property. There's very what? Very little potential in that okay. property as it is. We're breaking even at this, so we're paying. <clears throat> How many, how many employees do we have at the War Pony, Cody, approximately? I, I'm not sure with that. Well, that, yeah. you know, you take this into consideration. That, what, how long was that, five years ago? And we're just, and we're breaking even, and especially with the Apache Casino coming in. You know, I, I go down to Texas quite a bit, 
And I make a point to every time I come in, or going down there or coming back, because I could go through Grandfield and that area, I go by there, and there's, there's more employee cars than there are customer cars. You know, and, and to me, it's, it's you know, we're breaking even. We're, what's, what's the point of breaking even for five or six years so far? We're not gaining. And with Apache Casino just coming in, good luck. Any, right. any plans that we have are, are not to break even out of property? If they continue that way, honestly, we're, we're looking at finding other purposes for that property that would be profitable and, and would give a return to the tribe. Guy, guy's going first. <coughs> you can pass some of the, the mic, thanks. Uh, mine's more just a comment. Um, I'm concerned about the flooding. Um, my family allotment is along Cash Creek and I've been watching the Cash Creek change its uh, movement over the past couple of years. And every couple of years, the, the dam at Elgin, uh, they release more water than they normally do. And every time they release more water, it changes the, the way the creek moves. And where I live at, um, over here, um, they, uh, the creek moves so much that it ate into the railway and the, the, the trains couldn't take that railway anymore. And they had to come and do this big repair and it took about a couple of months, but they had to redo the whole air, uh, railway because the, the creek ate it away, the ground underneath it. You could just walk on the railroad tracks and there's nothing beneath you. Um, but I remember in, I think it was 2014, we had a, like, a, like a three week long rain and they had the tribal employees putting sandbags over there by the casino uh, right off the highway. And I know that the water park has gotten flooded several times. So, um, and my father, my father has pictures from the 1980s where the Cache Creek over, uh, overtook the railroad and went way up almost onto our family property. So I, I'm not concerned for maybe every five years or every 10, I'm concerned for like maybe every 10, 20 years, there might be like a big one. And I just want that to be noted, just every now and then there's a big rain and sometimes it really floods. Yeah, I mean, I think there's good news and bad news. The good news is that we can locate our travel center strategically outside of the floodplain, so we can definitely do that. The bad news is the event center, there's not a real way to strategically locate it on our existing properties. So we do have to address the flooding. We are aware of it. And so that is, you know, part of this plan is to mitigate that and, and come up with some, especially federal funding, because it is tied into climate change. And it is, you know, the Bureau of Reclamation's job to address these sorts of things. So hopefully we can have that worked out. But again, this is just our plan. And sometimes the best plans have obstacles. But my hope and my promise is to try to overcome the obstacles, right? And so that's what we're working on. And not, le not letting this is a little thing like flooding get in our way. Mr. Tashikwa, Mr. Harry Tashikwa, for the record. Yes, you, uh, we've got to realize that these plans for a conference center on that south side, it's been in the makings for a while. So it's, it's about time we really start looking at doing this. And along with the uh, phases out of Red River, there's, those have been in planning too. And moving forward on this is going to be great for the tribe. It's going to be great for the casinos, it's going to be great for employees. So I'm really looking forward for these plans because like I said, they have been there for a long period of time. And it's about time we start looking at and, and repairing that wheel, you know. So that's, that's, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Okay. And Mrs. Burgess, and I apologize, I skipped that's you, okay. sorry. Um, in your plan, uh, are you guys planning for the contingency reserves? I know that was a topic last year. Um, where they were trying to take the money, they were going to go to the people, ask uh, the people for money for that reserve when actually it's supposed to be included in the entertainment budget or the CEO budget. Um, is that going to be included in this priority plan? It's not in the current plan. There's been some ongoing discussion, and I think part of the problem is once it's asserted that the contingency reserve violated the RAP, 
then that continues to haunt the organization because now someone has said that and it's not directly addressed if it is, you know, it's not directly in the wrap. And so then that raises the need to amend the wrap to make it clear. And so I think that's what the ongoing discussions have been around. I personally think we have a lot of other work to do on the wrap. And so that may be something that comes up in April. Mr. Chairman, I did have a comment. Um, this resolution doesn't speak to the gaming board of directors with our new gaming ordinance. The, and so are you just going to, whenever that ordinance does get approved, are you just going to include them? Or are you gonna make a new, like give them a directive for this or? Since we right now are functionally the board, whenever a new board comes in, um, I think they will have to live with this unless they take action to repeal it, which I hope that they don't. And um, if they did, I guess we can ask them what their business reasons for repealing this would be. But this would be setting the strategic direction right now at time point zero, and so they will have to they'll have to carry this out on our behalf. Okay, um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I, I do believe we should have. I'm trying to think where the priorities should be, but. We should list the fact that we're looking at that center, the gasoline center, whatever we want to call it, convenience center, and future hotel and et cetera. And I think that should be listed here as number four. So we keep it in mind. So I would amend this to include in four those items. Okay. So for four, you the want travel, to travel. Yes. Gasoline, all that matters. That center you talk about right off Gore. Yeah, that's oh, already there on number yeah. one, actually. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I would expand on that. Okay, so for the travel center under number one, you want to list specifically on Gore Avenue? Yes. Okay. And then you want to add a number four that is hotel. And convention. Well, you have a convention yeah. center up above. So hotel in Lawton? I think number four should be Texas. And number four can be Texas. I agree yeah. with that, too. So number three is includes Texas already. But we can make that express. Um, so you want to have number three be explore diversification towards gaming off-reservation in Texas? Yes, in Texas. Okay. And number four, hotel in Lawton? Yes. With the responsible party being the entertainment CEO? Yes. But at the same time, I... When I look at these one, two, three, you know, when we look at going to the council in October, and I almost want to suggest November, mm -hmm. I think October is going to be too quick. We need to see the readouts, I feel, of revenue coming in and all that. So I would suggest that be changed to November on meeting the council meeting. Yeah. And then. I think it works much better. I don't want to wait too long. We already have Washington Take a Reserve for October 26th. I know that's something we need to discuss further. We can amend it. Let's talk about that one, and we can amend it if needed and give and, and release the date. But for now, I will. I do agree. Let's amend. It says Travel Center on Gore Avenue. Explore diversification towards gaming off reservation in Texas, and then add number four, hotel in Lawton, responsible party, entertainment CEO, with a deadline of ongoing. Yes. And so I, will, I, will, I agree to those amendments as the author of this resolution. Anyone else and have one, any? One other item. Yes. And that's the uh, action to safeguard the, you know, the, the water. Yep, that's All in those? here already. Okay. Yep, you see where it says. For, it's for Stephen Lee, but we're calling him the Natural Resources Director, which is his title. Okay. But yeah, he's working on that. I would like to make a motion to approve with the amendments. Okay. There's a motion to approve with amendments by Committee Woman Number Three, Casnavoid. Is there a second? A second. Second by Secretary Treasurer Tipicani. Miss uh, Sobo, did you have a, a comment I was or a question? Say on there where you were talking about your general council meetings mm -hmm. for October. Why don't you put part two in November? That way, once you don't cover in October, you you know you're going to schedule for November. All right. Let's say October or November. Yeah. 2024. Is that okay? Who is the movement? Was uh, Alice? Is that okay with you, Alice? Yes. 
Okay, second is Tipicani, is that okay with you? Yes. All right, all right. Any other further discussion? Uh, I just have okay. another comment. Mr. Farrar and then Ms. Tashikwa. Okay, um, yeah, recently uh, we got a proposal from a lobbyist, uh, the Banner Group, and uh, they could access up to $4 million through the Tribal Climate Resilience Grant Program, which um, could reduce our you know, need for financing too. So we'll talk about that in the upcoming work sessions so that we can bring it forward to general counsel as well and with uh, the CEO and our realty director as well. Yeah. Okay, I would like to uh, make a suggestion on this particular resolution with our strategic plan and that uh, when we attend the general council meeting, maybe have this on the agenda so that it will enforce, let the general council vote on it, to enforce it that no one, I don't care who is in the, as the board directors, that they, they have to um, follow through with this plan. Yep, I like it. We can do that. I it's like just it. just a suggestion. Yeah, no, to reinforce it, because that's to, Mr. Tashikwa's point, Harry's point, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about things and then sometimes they don't get done and that's kind of why I wanted to put this in black and white, right, is to say this is what our plan is mm -hmm. and if we don't do it, let's give a rhyme and a reason why we didn't do it. And maybe that is we couldn't overcome the flooding obstacles, but I don't want the reason to just be, well, we didn't get around to it or we got busy or we got distracted or you know, we stopped liking each other or whatever. I don't, I don't want any of that to happen. So that's why I want to put this in black and white right now that we are committing to that this is the plan <coughs> and we can have the tribal council even co-sign to even further uh, reinforce that. Any other discussion? Yeah, Mr. Siminski. You don't get that grant for the water tower? For, for the water tower? Yeah. We applied for some grants for a water tower here and I don't think we've heard back whether we've gotten them yet. Well, see, uh your number two threat is fire in evil. Also, uh, did you get that million and a half grant? Uh, I mailed it to you, the info on that, for tribal tourism. We, um, and is that, I think that might be the same one that you sent me, yeah. So that one was a, uh, I'm trying to remember, it wasn't a full on grant, it was some sort of planning, but we, yeah, we're aware of it and so we're looking at it, yep. Yeah, also, um, Trying to see if I can get you all a water wastewater plant and water treatment plant because you need that because you know all that toxic water. Uh, like I said, it's pretty pretty serious because yep. uh, uh, that contaminated water will screw you up. And uh, Deval, like I told you, all those lands in Deval are Comanche trust lands, and I'm one of them. And we'd like to see the roads fixed. We need water and sewer facilities. And then I got these corporations that want to do business with the tribe. And I'm gonna be looking on, uh, soon as probably end of September, I'm gonna be going on to see if we can get that stadium built. Big name entertainment. So uh, that's why, you know, I wanna get this done before I go. It's like Diana, you told me, you're gonna build, we build down there you're going to be a billion dollar tribe. Remember, this is Comanche trust land. And I know about all the scams from our state and federal agencies, and they all should be indicted on RICO charges, all to get land, playing us for land, playing us for a casino. Thank you. And I really, and I do appreciate you passing along the grants very much. Thank you. Mr. Pee Wee Wardy. Just a quick note that uh, dose of reality, I don't know if you, you're talking about the flooding and it's been talked about, but I don't know if you guys ever seen it in all these years, actually see it and how much it flooded. How much that flood went all the way to Lee Boulevard to that smoke shop there. When, I, when, I'm, when you guys talked about building, that's great that you're building, that's great. But dose of reality is have you guys seen that water when it was flooded? It was all over, all over. You know, so I just, I know I'm not a Corps of Engineer, but reality tells me that it was, if you guys saw it, you guys saw how, how far it went. It went very far, very far. So I'm not a Corps of Engineer, but you just need to be cautious about that. Because yep. they built stuff anyway. 
like Wichita yeah. the one in Wichita Falls. I'm sure the Corps of Engineers was involved in that. Look, you guys know, you've seen that in Wichita Falls. It's, it's, it's a, it was a hotel. Now it's nothing. Things happen. Things happen. So just be cautious. That's all I request. I yep. hope. And I, I appreciate the comment. And like I said, we'll be planning around it. And, you know, who knows? Maybe the plan will be let's make money for 49 years. And if it floods one time, one out of 50 is worth it. And maybe the plan will be let's build a dam or let's build a retention pond, you know, but the point is that this is just a first step to saying we are going to make a plan and we are going to make sure we consider all of the hurdles and we address them somehow, some way. All right. Call for the question from the vice chair. All in favor to uh, approve resolution number 122-2024 as amended. Chairman, real quick, did you want to add Hazel's comment to this resolution? Uh, I didn't no. take that okay. as an amendment, okay. but just as a, no. as a comment. Okay. Yep. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Abstentions. Motion passes. Um, we have a few more resolutions. I've got a note that, our, that, you know, it's lunchtime. We could go for another few minutes. We could take a lunch recess right now. I'm just looking for CBC. What do you want to do? Right. We'll, we'll push ahead a couple more minutes. Yes. Continue. And uh, we got a, we got a full agenda here. So, our next resolution is a resolution transferring gaming revenue from Comanche Nation Gaming Commission to Comanche Nation Entertainment. And I'll just provide the background for this. And this is something that kind of goes um, along with another resolution. But there's a common question that I get from tribal members and that is about the budget. And we vote on the budget every year, and I get a question commonly. <laughs> Whatever happened with that? Did we hit that budget? Did we overspend that budget? Did we underspend that budget? The loop is never closed. There's never any follow-up. Um, and so that's something that we will have to communicate better. Uh, but I will tell you for at least the last several years, we have been under the budget, and so there has been money that has been accumulating, and that goes for the tribe itself, and that also goes for the Gaming Commission. And so the Gaming Commission has been running a tight ship, and they haven't overspent their budget, and so they've been underspending their budget, and so over time there's some money that has been accumulated. That raises the question of what should we do with this? Should we just let it be with the Gaming Commission to be a cushion for them? Should we... Um, split it 60-40 with 40% going to the per cap so we all can get another $50 and we can get a little bit extra on our services? Or should we reinvest this money into the casinos to get things like new flooring, you know, better amenities? And so the CBC has made the decision that we should reinvest this. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I said, you know, we had to make some hard decisions around different things, but the decision that we've made is to leave a s modest cushion for the gaming commission and to transfer the majority of the money back to the casinos for the express purposes of using it for improvements such as a pool at the Red River Hotel, raised flooring at the Red River Hotel, and raised flooring at the Comanche Nation Casino. So our two main properties will be getting new flooring if this resolution is approved. I'm going to read it, but before I read it, there's an issue that goes along with talking about money. And if you read the newspaper, this was actually the subject of my column in the newspaper this month. So if you don't read the newspaper, you can read it. But some people don't want to disclose our financials to the world, which I understand. But you also know that I'm all about transparency. And so how can you be transparent if you're keeping something hidden? So it, sometimes it creates a stalemate and I think that may be some of the reasons why we don't get a lot of business done. So myself, I'm all about giving the information out unless and until someone can articulate to me exactly how it's going to be used. So if someone knows this exact number, if that can hurt us in some way, I'm all for keeping it secret. If it can't hurt us in some way, then I'm all for giving it out. But I'm going to let the business committee decide whether to make a motion to stop me from actually saying the numbers on here. Um, or if they want me to actually read them. It's their call ultimately. So any motions with respect to reading these numbers in this resolution? 
All right, I will read the resolution. A resolution transferring gaming revenue from Comanche Nation Gaming Commission to Comanche Nation Entertainment. Whereas the Comanche Nation is a federally recognized Indian tribe with a constitution approved and ratified by the Secretary of the Interior of the United States on January 9th, 1967 to safeguard tribal rights, powers, and privileges to improve the economic, moral, educational, and health status of its members, and whereas the Comanche Nation Constitution, Article 6, Section 7J, provides that the Comanche Business Committee has the authority to promulgate and enforce ordinances and codes governing law and order to protect the peace, health, safety, and general welfare on land determined to be within Comanche tribal jurisdiction, and whereas to promote the general welfare and improve the economic status of tribal members, the Comanche Business Committee has enacted a gaming ordinance approved by the National Indian Gaming Commission. And whereas the gaming ordinance establishes Comanche Nation Entertainment as an unincorporated entity wholly owned by the nation. And whereas the gaming ordinance requires the Comanche Nation Chief Executive Officer to perform gaming related duties as assigned or delegated by the CBC. And whereas section 316 of the gaming ordinance and its predecessors provides that the commission shall develop a budget to be approved by the Comanche Business Committee. And whereas in prior fiscal years, budgeted funds that were not expended were reserved and not allocated or spent. And whereas the reserved funds have accumulated to the sum of $4,583,115.52. And whereas the funds originated as gaming revenue and the nation's gaming facilities need improvements and renovations. And whereas the Comanche Business Committee has determined it is in the best interests of the nation for the Gaming Commission to reserve $500,000 of the accumulated funds in case of budget shortfall, and for the remaining funds to be transferred to Comanche Nation Entertainment for capital expenditures at the beginning of the fiscal year. And now therefore be it resolved, the Comanche Business Committee hereby directs the Gaming Commission to transfer $4,083,115.52 from the bank account ending in 3327 to Comanche Nation Entertainment on October 1st, 2024. And be it further resolved that the Chief Executive Officer of Comanche Nation Entertainment is hereby assigned the duty of using such funds for capital expenditures listed on the August monthly report to the Business Committee to include at least a pool for the Red River Hotel Casino, raised flooring at the Red River Hotel and Casino, and raised flooring at the Comanche Nation Casino. So that's the resolution. I'll take questions and comments in a second. I have my own comments that I'll provide first, which is just sometimes people get after business committee members or lack of progress. And it, does, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to move a ship as big as ours. But hopefully, this is at least some modest progress when you walk into those casinos and you see some new floors in a couple months, and this is how we got it done. So, any comments or questions from the CBC? I would like to see in the whereas, the last whereas, I put the fiscal year 2025. I, I insert that. Okay. So, the last whereas right now ends beginning of the fiscal year, and we'll say beginning of the fiscal year 2025. Yes. Any other questions or comments from CBC members. No, it's not. I make a motion to approve. Okay, motion to approve by the vice chairwoman Doya Baisovo is second by committeeman number two Carrara. Any further discussion? Mrs. Burgess. <laughs> and one and while the mic is waiting, one thing I want to emphasize a lot is that we have our gaming commissioner here, Mr. Ramirez, and he double checked triple checked investigated this very thoroughly to ensure that the what we are stating here this is just money that was not was on their budget and wasn't spent and accumulated is the truth of the matter this isn't money that was squirreled away through any sort of clandestines or inappropriate or nefarious means but he has quadruple assured me that, that is the case mrs burgess and i'm very confident that mr ramirez did do that um, I was going to just make a comment in hopes that 
this would be something that we do every year because this is not the first time the Gaming Commission has bailed our nation out. And it's not bad, it's not a bad thing that they're keeping their money. However, I think that we should cap their, um, what they're not spending and give that back to the nation because as we know now, it's helping. And this is like the second or third time that we had to ask the commission um, to return the money. And like I said, it's not a bad thing, but as we all know, the gaming commission to every <coughs> tribe, ga tribal gaming, um, is, a, is a cost to the nation. It's not a money generating. We're not supposed to be generating revenue from that. Um, it's a cost, a very big cost. And um, I realize that they've been keeping money like this for years. And, and I think that's a good thing, but I, I just hope that we do this every year. I agree 100%. And I think kind of what I have been saying and what we have been discussing as a CBC is, you know, it's, it's good to have money saved, but you want it to be intentional because you don't want to oversave, you don't want to undersave, so you want to have it be intentional. And so a way to do that, obviously, is to, at the end of the year, have a report of, you know, how much was underspent or overspent. And so I agree. Uh, Mr. Ramirez has a comment. So I'll just say that um, uh, moving forward and even in uh, the prior years, uh, we do have a, a uh, way of returning any funds that weren't spent uh, through the year through um, budget modification to where we don't, we, we basically, if we didn't spend, let's say, 25000 the the following month, we don't take that amount from gaming. Um, this amount was, of course... Uh, a lot larger and would have been probably a couple of years worth of budget modification. Um, so when we brought this to the CBC, I said we could either not receive our drawdown for, for a few years until we uh, exhaust this amount or return it back to the uh, properties and let them do some good with it. and. Thankfully, the CBC agreed that returning this amount in one lump sum would do a lot better than not taking a drawdown for 24, 36 months, however long it would have been. Um, moving forward, uh, as long as I'm the executive director or commissioner, um, we will, at the end of the year, look at how much we have not spent and do the budget modification so that we don't receive that fund so that this amount doesn't grow in the future. Um, but just to answer that question, that's how that will be done. The contingency will be maintained at that amount or adjusted if need be in the future, up or down. Um, but that's the way that, that those shortfalls or, or um, non-expenditures will be handled. All right. Is it uh, Kuchikwita? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. I just wonder, how long did it take for that to accumulate? I, I believe it was four years. Four years? Uh, or I don't... It, it would have been... It would have been uh, four or five, six years. It would have been quite some time for that amount to have accumulated um, because the amount uh, of overage is usually if... It's a large amount. It's only in the maybe 100000 So, yeah, it was years' worth of accumulation. Mm -hmm. I ask that because the business committee approved their budget yearly. Yes. So it's been approved yearly. Yes. Either overlooked or it wasn't recorded or just it, I, it doesn't make sense to me how that much got there. Right. I can't speak to that. Um, when I first came on, I, uh, of course, was taking care of some things. Um, by the time I noticed that we had that much of a, uh, a buildup, uh, we, I immediately brought it and um, did the investigations, which took some time uh, to make sure that it wasn't put there or, or there was no um, ill intent uh, with that money being built up. Um, so I can't tell you how long it had been building up, 
Um, but again, we took action just as soon as we, we noticed it to make sure that it was returned and returned properly. Um, because as uh, the chairman noted, this couldn't be given straight to the tribe because it was an expense of the casinos. So to give it straight to the tribe would have circumvented the wrap. Um, so we had to give it back to the casino so that it could go through the 6040 wrap. But um, yeah, I don't know how long it had been building, unfortunately. I can't tell you that. <clears throat> give them, let them get the mic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you need the mic? You have more to, no, okay. Right. Yeah, I think it's a great point, though, and I mean, I, you know, this was found, I think, before I even was elected, so I can't take any personal credit for it, um, but I think it highlights the importance of being comfortable talking about money, because it's one of those things that people don't want to talk about, get very skittish, but then if you don't talk about it, then you can lose track of it. Mr. One Wadilla. quick question, Mr. Ramirez. Uh, they talked about increasing salaries up to $15, hourly salary. Bridge benefits, is that going to have an effect upon this transfer to 4,000? Is it premature to transfer to 4,000, $4 million? Uh, as far as the commission budget, um, I will say that we uh, operate competitively as far as salaries, so uh, there will be no need for CNGC to um, increase any salaries uh, at this time. So I thought you went to fifteen dollars for twelve dollars. Well, so the gaming commission already pays more than fifteen dollars an hour for all its employees. Okay, very good. Yeah. I would like to call for the vote. Call for the question. All right. So resolution number one twenty three dash twenty twenty four, as amended to add fiscal year twenty twenty five to the final whereas. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. And resolution number 123 passes. It's now 1235. And so I'm making the executive decision to call for a lunch recess, um, especially out of respect for our stenographer who's been going for an hour 20 now. Mm -hmm. We have a pretty full agenda. And so I'm not gonna give it a full hour. I'm gonna give you 45 minutes. So we're gonna be calling back into session at 120 exactly. So I will see you all then. Thank you.